And finally on Channel 4, the news at 10. To this point, when you sit here, you realise occasionally just how tired you are. Checking the front. Three minutes tired, transmission, tired. three minutes. We didn't know what was expected of us. We didn't know what the programme would look like. There were no, thank God, focus groups in those days to tell us what the, the public expected of us. The ratings were very high in those early days. People apparently were prepared to take any amount of blood and thunder and, and gloom and doom because, you know, it was what was happening and they wanted to know. There was a great sort of sense that People were doing something radical, dramatic. The atmosphere was very different from today. I mean, much less focused, really. I mean, jolly hard working, but quite hard playing as well. Are we still boy? Yeah, we do. <laughs> it was the news that put the world to bed at night, and uh, a lot of people watched news at 10, and then that was it. You know, the Queen hadn't died, the world hadn't stopped. President Bill Clinton's trial of the American Senate. We have reflected over the last 30 years the way in which Britain has changed. We've tried to adapt the program to reflect those changes. The archive of News at 10 is a mirror of the way we've all developed. And with something for all pet lovers to think hard about, a contraceptive pill for dogs. So do join us in two minutes. The first night of News at 10 was the worst possible night that any television journalist could ever imagine in their wildest nightmare. There was nothing around. Any story we had could have been the lead story. There's obviously a place for the railways and business economy today. There was a rail strike that was about to happen. President Chombi in the Congo had been kidnapped and taken to Katanga. Mr. Chombi, was he frightened at all? He didn't appear to be, no. I mean, uh, he was a very cheerful man and um, never seemed to have a worry in the world. The first night was rather like building an enormous new aeroplane and then seeing whether it flew, and it just about flew, but it then kind of circled the airport and landed rather clumsily. We had to improve its performance enormously, and we did. This was quite a revolution in terms of British broadcasting, a half-hour hard news programme uh, in prime time. And uh, we were lucky, frankly, to start at 10 o'clock and end. Uh, I didn't care very much what went on in between, just the physical act of getting the programme going and a commercial in the middle. And I didn't know at the time, but at the end of the first week, there were those among the uh, moguls in ITV who uh, wanted to pull the programme off the air by the following Monday. The ITV bosses mistrusted the idea of half an hour of news. They didn't think it would work. And as a sop to Geoffrey Cox, who was then the editor of ITN, and to the ITN board, they wrote uh, News at 10 into the schedules only for uh, 12 weeks. And they were convinced that after 12 weeks it would collapse. The only way you can find out anything at all in China is by reading wall posters. So stories that people have been killed and that noses and ears have been cut off. The companies didn't let up. Having failed to abort the pregnancy, they tried to strangle the baby in its cradle. But we fought back, and in the summer of 1969, we had all five editions of News at 10 of one week in the top 10 most popular programs. And we had 12 million people watching every night, and we knew we were safe. And these, in fact, may be terrorists, because uh, intelligence said that there was, in fact, a suspected band of terrorists hiding out inside this house. Perhaps the most important change that uh, News at 10 brought about was the, what they call in the business the reporter package, because in, before News at 10 started, you would write your script uh, and um, send it back with the film, and they would then uh, voice it in the studio. In the past few days, thousands of refugees have flocked across it, escaping from the furious battle which has turned the ancient imperial capital of Vietnam into the shattered shell of a once proud and graceful city. Well, the reporter package changed all that. You had to record your commentary in the field, and it was sent back to the office, and they cut the pictures according to your commentary. So it made the reporter the key person, and therefore, I think, 
the proof was that the reporting was better, more informed, more on the spot. I think that was really the big change because until then it hadn't happened at all on uh, British television. There was a much tighter understanding in those days of what was news and what was not news. That news was about what had happened that day. But the idea of background features, um, of reflecting sociological movements and changes in British society, I don't think we thought that that was part of the role of news. We covered the, the whole of the youth uh, explosion in, uh, and, the, and, the, and the rise of events in the 60s. Instead of having a private honeymoon, it's a private protest. For the violence that's going in the world, you see. To say, uh, Be it's... sure that instead of making war, it's better to just stay in bed. Let's stay in bed for spring. And you know. grow your hair. It was in current affairs that you got the programs on the pill, that you got programs on abortion, that you got programs investigating uh, every aspect of society. The biggest single weapon that we had on our side was the development of the satellite. We acquired this satellite called Telstar for 20 minutes. It was fuzzy for the first minute and a half and fuzzy for the last minute and a half, and then you had a clear picture. <laughs> Badly fiddling with the knob, trying to try to hold it, just like we would have held. But this, this is... I remember that Ian Trefowen, who later became Director General of the BBC, was down at Goonhilly Down itself, and the picture was coming through Goonhilly, and I heard uh, Ian Trefowen say, This is a face. Bouncing around, but you can see absolutely clearly this is a man sitting behind a desk. <laughs> this is the first television picture to come across the Atlantic. It's kind of difficult to remember now, but you, you sat on the end of a line in the studio, and somebody came up on the other side of the world, and everybody in the newsroom still switched on to it. You know, we all were quite amazed by this feat. San Francisco police answered a complaint about a noisy party in the Haight-Ashbury district of the city. When they knocked on the door... In the very early days of News at 10, Margot Fontaine and Rudy Nureyev, who'd been dancing in San Francisco, were at a party when the police raided it, and it was a drug bust. ...dame Margot Fontaine. And it was in this littered stairwell they found Rudolf Nureyev. We heard from the news desk they'd been arrested, and we managed to get a satellite to San Francisco exclusively for News at 10. And it uh, showed uh, the desk sergeant questioning Nureyev. I mean, he'd heard of uh, Rudy the Red-Nosed Ranger, but he'd never heard of Nureyev. How do you spell your last name? And you had this scene where the desk sergeant was saying, how do you spell that? N-O, what's the name? No, and he couldn't spell it. And of course, it was hilarious. A local cameraman took a picture of these two megastars behind bars in an American police cell, and there was 40 seconds of film on the other side of the world. How do we get it back to London? In those days, the film was taken to San Francisco. It was sent by landline from San Francisco to Andover in Maine on the other side of the states, transmitted to the Telstar satellite that was only acquired for 20 minutes. It went down to Bordeaux, from there to Zurich, and finally to London. In the next day's newspapers, there was more said about the way we acquired that piece of news film than about the news story itself, which was, in a way, sensational enough. That satellite, it must be remembered, cost us in those days 7,000 pounds, which is about the equivalent of 100,000 pounds today. Well, today a satellite costs a postage stamp. But in those days, it was really something. And so it called for, it called for nerve. The great distinction about ITN in those days was the newscasters. They were not stage faces or actors or people who had been trained for this curious business of delivering the news. They were journalists who, if you like, graduated to the business of doing the news. And that was a big, big difference. The BBC did not put their newscasters in vision until a month before ITN came on the air in 1955. And when they did put them on in vision, they didn't name them because they were frightened that a cult of personality would grow up. This is the African township of Harare. Here, last night, violence broke out. 
fact, it was a, a program presented by journalists for the public. And it was this which really gave the program its edge. The fact that if the seams showed, it could all be incorporated into the fact that these were human beings giving you the news. They weren't godlike creatures who never stumbled or always knew how to pronounce the, the name the right way. They were humans who'd probably been out in the field, covered the stories they were telling you about, and therefore that, that fallibility, if you like, that they sometimes showed was all part of their integrity. Uh, we'll be back soon, as soon as we have any more movement. Yes, we will go back to Peter Snow as soon as something new happens in Grosvenor Square. We think it's important enough today to put in this extra 30 minutes of program, so simply to take up the themes which we were discussing earlier this afternoon, whether demonstrations like this should be peaceful or violent. Now, if these plans materialize, some of the steam, perhaps a lot of the steam, will go out of the Breton nationalist movement. Sandy with his sort of, he looked like a benign pugilist with his beaten up face, much helped by an accident in a minicab on the way from News of Ten one night. Uh, and um, he, uh, he really gave some grit to, uh, to, to, to the performance by looking as if he was part of the affray which he was reporting. Television news produced something that only Coronation Street had managed before, which was the regular appearance in the living room of a person. And Reggie would come in nightly, and people would want to see how Reggie was. And sometimes Reggie wasn't as well as he was last night. And as a result, uh, people followed Reggie and his ups and downs with a, with a passion. At news night, we hope to welcome those balloonists tomorrow. See you then. Good night. Reggie Bersenkamp was certainly professional, but he was far from safe. Reggie was this strange character. He was really a refugee from the 18th century. I mean, he was elegant, eccentric, and bawdy. Don't worry about Stories 4A, which has just got nothing here, new in Reggie. it at Look, all. Let us just get on with okay. what we've got now. He always wore a handkerchief tucked into his sleeve, and uh, one viewer sent him her, uh, for her Christmas present, a package of handkerchiefs to Reggie. And Reggie sent them back. And w when he told me, I said, but why did you send them back, Reggie? Was this uh, so as not to give the impression of accepting bribes from the audience? No, 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 he said, it wasn't that. The hems were flat of her, the handkerchief she sent me. I wear mine rolled. And that's it for tonight from News at 10 from us. Good night to you. Do you think you had the right winner of the derby, Reggie? I didn't personally, but uh, I hope we do in the program. For every American, this has to be the proudest day of our lives, and for people all over the world. I think all of that time should be looked upon as a novelty. These things were happening for the first time. There was a national event that people could sit down at 10 o'clock and in half an hour see things that in those days had not been possible before. I remember these pictures coming in at the time of the Biafran War and that bustling newsroom that's always on the go fell to total silence. Biafra was the first televisual famine. It was the first time that Mr. and Mrs. Joe Bloggs, sitting in their comfortable front parlor, saw starvation and people dying on screen. There was a huge movement away from being microphone stands for politicians, captains of industry. It was a time of, of terrific relevance to British news gathering because money was no object and we rode alongside the three American networks, ABC, NBC and CBS and basically the, the rest of the world took our pictures and so the, the news gathering in the world was the three Americans, the BBC and News at 10 and that, that was a supreme time.
David Masterman owns a packaging company worth six million pounds. He spent 10 years working for a large multinational before redundancy pushed him to go it alone. Of course, David doesn't know this yet because he's only five. But when he does, our pensions and investments will be flexible enough to adapt whatever path he chooses. Clerical medical, the choice of the professional. Buy one pair of Boots brand spectacles with scratch resistant lenses, then choose another pair absolutely free. What a choice from Boots Opticians. In the Financial Advisor Service Awards, it was Cheltenham and Gloucester who, in the face of stiff competition, snatched yet another five-star award for customer service. To enjoy Cheltenham and Gloucester's first-class mortgage service, sail into any branch of Cheltenham and Gloucester, Lloyds Bank or TSB. Cheltenham and Gloucester, looking after your best interests. Fast foil packed for extra freshness. Have you been refreshed by Typhoon? For information on your nearest independent financial advisor, call Clerical Medical on 0800 77 90 77. And finally, continues to chart the history of the news at 10. Viewers should be aware that part two opens with violent news footage from the Biafran War, which some may find upsetting. Can you, can you ask him if he's a Biafran soldier? And, and Are you a Biafran soldier? I'm not a Biafran soldier, but I can show you the place where they're there, but uh, I'm not a, 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 a Biafran soldier. And why do you know that? So whether you're not a Biafran soldier, why do you manage to know the place Biafran soldier is? The, the, they're on the other side. I did not show and would not show the actual act of death. I think that is uh, utterly wrong and that uh, if we're showing that kind of thing on television, we're reverting to the days when people uh, stood around the gallows and saw it as a spectacle. What are you doing here? Uh, what are you doing here? Do sir, you live here? No, sir. I just I'm from house to, to take part. I, from there, I, I begin to look my parents. Mm. Are you an Igbo? Yes, sir. But you're not a Biafran soldier? Yeah. In the early days of News at 10 was a civil war in Nigeria where one of the states, Biafra, had broken away from the central government. And there were stories around of alleged atrocities being committed by the federal troops. Are you looking for who? My parents. Where mother, are mother and father. Father. Your mother and father? Yes, sir. Where are they? I don't know where they are, sir. This young man was absolutely terrified and he had his hands tied and he was pleading for his life. He was 17, 18 years old, I don't know. What will happen to him now, Captain? Now, I'm going to take him to, to, to our HQ. It's, yeah. a, it's a rebel, brother and soldier. But you're not going to kill him? No, we, we, we don't kill him now. You're going, to, kill him. Him. you're going to interrogate him, are you? Not? Yes, yes. So you're not going to be killed, you're going to be okay? All right? Yes. You will be all right. You, mm -hmm. They're not going to kill you, you see. They're going to just take you prisoner, and then you'll, they will feed you. Is that right, Captain? You'll give him food? I give him everything. Huh? I'll give him he came up, and the camera was still running, and, and I said to him, look, you know, relax, <laughs> kind of. Uh, you're a prisoner of war, and I'll show you how naive I was then. I'm a civilian. I'm looking for my parents. Is that so? Their friends have, have killed my parents. They have friends? Yes, they have killed my parents because we have turned to one Nigeria. Uh -huh. It's all right. Because we have turned to one Nigeria, they have killed my parents. Finish. It was a horrific piece of film and we spent a lot of time wondering how to edit it and it became a, 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 a very famous a sequence uh, at the time and what we decided to do was to end it after the first shot. Within a few days that officer was court-martialed by the Nigerian government and sentenced to death and we were invited in to film his execution by the Nigerian authorities um, but we declined because we said you know we didn't want to show a fortuitous killing but we showed the first killing because it was news and was evidence in its own right.
war was absolutely integral, not just to News at 10's success, but to, to television news in general. War is movie, I tell you. War is Hollywood. We're going in now to investigate a report that a house possibly has a cache of terrorist uh, guns and ammunition in it. Known terrorists have been captured this morning from this house, so it's quite possible that it, it is... A guy called Alan Hart, who was the first of the great kind of showbiz warriors, and he won't mind me saying that because he was the guy who introduced us to the ducking and the, you know, my God, it's all happening behind me, uh, razzmatazz, which has stood me in good stead. Four minutes past six, and the first of the Turkish troops have landed in Cyprus. About five of these aircraft passed over in the last five minutes. They were guided in by jet fighters, and the very first paratroopers are now hitting Cyprus soil. Over there, Alan. You okay? You just burned. That's. I hit my arm. Ah. Ah. In the bag of bandage. Ah. Hang on. Wait. Wait. Wait for it to bubble up a bit. You little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> This is how crude actually does it. This is what it's like in Beirut, okay? It's no picnic. When the French were here, they used to call the road that runs from Hue northwards towards Hanoi the street without joy. Well, the city of Hue itself has now become a city without joy. Vietnam. It was probably more a reporter's war than any other war since. It was the first uh, television war, I suppose. As long as you had a, a letter of accreditation from your organization, you could be accredited by them. This gave you the rank, the honorary rank of major or colonel, which allowed you to enter any off officer's mess, uh, to fly on any helicopter, virtually any plane. That war was really, in part, lost when television brought pictures of American soldiers in body bags back to America, and middle America was able to see that war wasn't John Wayne. War was squalid and horrible, and even American soldiers behaved in the most questionable ways. Everybody had seen television and its power as primarily a, a propaganda force. And it, in the early days of News at 10, uh, there wasn't that sophistication. And propaganda, uh, spin doctoring, simply had not arrived. They were not a part of the equation. And once men in suits and men with stars on their shoulders uh, began to think that, that television was another arm uh, in their armory, um, then I think a, a lot of the fun, a lot of the excitement, and a lot of the relevance went out. It took politicians, believe it or not, a long time to realize what a, a potent weapon television news was. They thought that newspapers were where the real power lay, and television was just something you did, if you like, as a sideline, if at all. <laughs> Can you say Going around with Margaret Thatcher was a revelation. Nobody campaigned like this before. It was just normally a boring old round of evening speeches and not much in the way of active getting out among the people. Margaret Thatcher picked up the idea from the Americans that you actually had to get out there and do things, hence the birth of the photo opportunity. This is now the great photo call, and she's become really quite an expert at this. She spends really considerable minutes uh, getting the right photograph. That created um, a temptation which the uh, 
the marketing advisors of the politicians could not resist, if you like, to gild the lily, to say, well, let's make it more interesting for the cameras, and the more interesting we make it, the more pictures they'll show and the better coverage uh, our political leader will get. And so, famously, of course, we had the picture of Margaret Thatcher sitting in a field on a farm near Ipswich, cradling a calf. Now, you may say that was a photo opportunity too far, but at least it made the point that here was an entirely different uh, campaign. Bit by bit, as they began to look at the ratings figures and the attention that people were paying to it, they clearly understood how important TV news was. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11. 12, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Good evening. In Vietnam, the Social Services Secretary, Mrs. Castle, said today that rate increases next year will be to try and cool these passions, these rapidly rising passions. We had lots and lots of people applying to get into News at 10. Even the writer, uh, Geoffrey Archer, came once into my office and told me he thought he ought to take over the sports department. And, but uh, when I looked at his um, curriculum vitae, um, I decided that uh, his talents lay perhaps more with the realms of fiction than a fact. Things were happening in the place. People walked around smoking large cigars. Um, there were always bottles around. There was a, quite a a lot of drink at, at, at hand. The green room really could be called the sort of Savoy grill room. The whole atmosphere around News at 10 was a little bit like the Gentleman's Club in the sense that um, it was rather comfortable and certain people had very well established positions and nobody was going to turf them out of their particular leather armchair or stub their cigar out. There was no no smoking and there was no no drinking rule and I reckon that people needed those as a release. It was the culture of the time not to bother about that sort of thing, it was up to people themselves. What we wanted was to squeeze the best out of them and we certainly, uh, we certainly people certainly gave it. By late this afternoon, huge seas hid the tanker from view. Tonight, the winds are gusting at more than 50 miles an hour. With this deterioration in the weather, the pressure on the ship and the mass of oil still aboard her is mounting. And with the storm in this direction, the pollution already in the sea is now being driven still faster towards the British Isles. Jon Snow, News at 10, on the coast of Britain. It's incredible to think back, really, that, that for one thing, I mean, just the mere fact of getting the film out of the camera and onto the screen involved at least a three-hour hiatus while it got bathed in a, a stinking morass of chemicals in the basement. And you had really to kind of negotiate your, your way through this because where you were in the pile of underdeveloped or undeveloped film absolutely depend, made it whether you got on the on News at 10 or not. Very often the competition with the BBC was who could actually get their film onto which flight. The, the, the problem then was, uh, could you get the Air France through Paris, which got into London two hours earlier than the Lufthansa, which went through Frankfurt and got in three hours later. Uh, and the other thing was, of course, that there was a lot of chartering of little light aircraft to carry the film to the big plane. Uh, and I well remember a dreadful time in Uganda when I was up against Brian Barron, where his fixer had signaled to our pilot to take off without our film. And Mohinder Dillon, our deturbanized Sikh cameraman, ran down the runway, flapping his arms and uh, preventing this man from taking off by throwing himself in front of the plane. Uh, and we eventually managed to get our, uh, uh, our film aboard it, and, and that was that. But I mean, dispatching somebody else's charter plane was a well-worn trick. News in those early days uh, was beyond price, and uh, that the, the accountants, though I'm sure there were excellent accountants operating inside ITN, were people whose names we didn't know uh, and who we never saw. And the idea that there should be financial restrictions on, on the gathering of news, if there was a big story, I mean, it, it just could not be contemplated. So the men remain behind in the desert as the hostages, as the women and children are set free. Already some of the women have refused the offer to leave Amman, preferring to stay here to wait for their men however long that wait may be. The story of Dawson's Field was about a British Overseas Airways aircraft, a VC-10, that had been hijacked. 
landed at Dawson's Field uh, in the Middle East, right in the middle of the desert, a disused airfield, full of passengers, especially full of young uh, school children uh, returning on school holidays from a, a, abroad. It was a big story at the time. And all the passengers were eventually released, the crew were released, and it left this aircraft, which the terrorists packed with explosives. Suddenly there was a knock on the door, and it was my local cameraman, the Palestinian cameraman we used. He was, said he was a lawyer. He said, you must come with me. I said, well, what's happening? He said, you must come back to the airfield. I said, why? He said, well, I want to do some filming. I said, we've done all the filming. He said, no, you must come with me. So anyway, we go. There are the three aircraft standing, the three jets in the middle of the desert. Amazing sight. And he must have got a signal because he started to film. I thought, why is he filming three aircraft? You know, we've done this a million times. Before I could say, look, forget it. First VC-10 went up bang, the other explosion, bang, the other explosion. All three aircraft suddenly exploded. So we had the only piece of film of this VC-10 exploding. I mean, I don't understand. How did you know? He said, well, I'm also a Mujahideen. I belong to this group. So ITN's string of cameramen was also a part of the hostage-taking group. And the producer there thought, I've got this great story. I've got to get back to London. Uh, he got the film, went to the airport, in Amman to take it to Cyprus for a flight to London. No aircraft around. Or the last one had taken off. He said, but there's one over here. And he chartered a French Air France a Caravelle. And he took off as the sole passenger carrying this film back to London. It was great fun in those days. It was the days before uh, television became a business, it was a public service, and it was enormous fun. Scotland Yard said today that the ending of the Northern Ireland hunger strike would not affect their Christmas security operations. In the late 1970s, we decided that time was uh, well due to have a woman newscaster among our mainstream uh, presenters. Well, I couldn't throw a man over my shoulder. Oh, yes, quite easily. Would you like to come and try? Although, in the early days of ITN, there had been women presenters uh, of, of various bulletins. It was high time we had a, a mainstream woman newscaster on the news at 10T. It was almost like choosing a Dalai Lama. We would keep an eye, look open for talent and make an invitation. BBC had got one up on them because they'd employed uh, Angela Riven. Uh, and you know a lot of publicity surrounded that and the BBC was suddenly seen as people who had really good ideas about the way that news should go and how to bring it to a new generation and perhaps attract more women into it and all the rest of it, and more men for that matter. I remember approaching Anna Ford after seeing her on a BBC science programme and asking her if she'd like to read the news and she told me that uh, she wasn't interested in money and didn't want her face to be very well known, but my successor David Nicholas managed to corrupt her. <laughs> I think I was rather sort of staid and rather unromantic when it came to the chemistry between male and female presenters, but I think my colleague Reggie Bosenkett, he was the star. He uh, pretended to be in love with Anna Ford and wrote poems to her. When I arrived, there was a bottle of red wine in the middle of a desk, and Reggie put his arm around me and said, um, very nice to meet you. He'd written in the Daily Mail the week before, he didn't think women were made newscasters because they couldn't read, and also their, their voices were too high-pitched. She made an enormous impact, uh, not only on the programme, but of course on the public. Uh, and that must have been quite tough for her at the time. It did change the face of the programme quite literally. And she was almost the Diana, if you like, uh, of, of the age at the time. She was followed everywhere and photographed everywhere she went. And she became, I think in many ways, one of the first true stars of, of news, of television news. Preparation is everything, which is why when you fly British Airways Club World to London Heathrow, there's a new arrivals lounge where you can shower, 
have a massage, and get your act together. Which is why Carmen's favorite airline is the world's favorite airline. shows us what you look like in different frames and you can wear your old glasses so it's easy to see which pair suits you best. Any questions? Mr. Hamilton? You don't think I'm gonna get double chin, do you? Computer eyes at Dolland and Aitchison. Lloyds and TSB are coming together. How can we help you live your life? What can we do to make it happen? Our new personal review service is here to help make things happen for you. Lloyd's TSB. Your life. Your bank. Television very much like newspapers in the 70s, uh, realized that British society was changing, and changing very fast. It was the beginning of the participation of a whole range of people who hadn't before that had their voice, except occasionally, if you like, in the Vox Pop. You now began to see people talking about schools, or the three-day week, or what was a proper wage for a day's work. We began to look at the effects of stories rather than just the stories themselves. The kind of second package, if you like, developed where the story might have been, uh, you know, industrial strife, but a second package would be about the families, the wife at home trying to cope with no money coming in, the children, how they were coping at school. The social consequences of the major stories began to be covered in much more depth. Thatcherism caused an upheaval in reporting, full stop in all kinds of ways, the sort of confrontations that she forced, first with the miners, then later the huge social unease over the poll tax, certainly meant that we devoted far more time to those kind of domestic issues. The miners' strike was, was a, again, a new experience for many of us, because this was the biggest uh, running civil unrest uh, that any of us could remember covering. I mean, it was extraordinary when, when you look back at it now that there were pitch battles daily going on in various parts of the country between miners and police. People used to say, oh, politics is boring. Because, of course, there were no cameras in the House of Commons. There wasn't even a radio feed when we started uh, News at 10 from the House of Commons. As those became available to us, better facilities, and as this greater awareness came through that really something quite astonishing was going on in Britain, under Mrs. Thatcher. I think that did shape our coverage, and I actually think that domestic politics became much, much more front line. As the programme grew older, the coverage of politics grew in intensity. It wasn't a bomb, but it was an ambush, because when the troops arrived, fire was opened up just down the road. In the coverage of the, of the Irish Troubles right through the 70s, somehow seeing it shot on film gave it a certain detachment. It was almost like watching a, a movie. It didn't really have the immediacy of, of real life. <laughs> to see it on videotape, in your own home. It looked like your own hometown, and I think that was the case for a lot of viewers as well. Oh, 
All of a sudden people realise that this is happening absolutely on our doorsteps in towns and streets that are just like our own to people who are just like us. It, beforehand I think it had looked very much like a foreign war. The introduction of ENG, electronic news gathering, tape instead of film, was really one of the biggest single revolutions uh, that news gathering for television has ever undergone. The United Nations and NATO say the punitive bombing raids will continue until General Mladic agrees to attend the negotiating table and talk about a lasting peace. It happened very quickly. Uh, I have to say the first time I ever filmed with ENG, I thought the red light in the viewfinder meant the camera was off, so I filmed a rather excellent exclusive story in Spain with the entire camera off. Um, no one had even showed me. So you were given a camera and you no training and you disappeared with it. No more processing film. Suddenly, electronic impulses. That's all it is. And you could beam them up to a satellite back down to London in a matter of seconds. It meant you could get material out from almost anywhere and you could get it out live. Nowadays, there's not a city in the world that doesn't have a satellite uplink to feed your story out of. And anywhere in between those cities, you can take a flyaway satellite dish. The biggest difference it made, in, in part, was getting past the sensors. The fact of the matter is we suddenly had a technology they really could do absolutely nothing about. I am now in a position to announce that Mr. Nelson Mandela will be released at the Victor Verstaat prison on Sunday, the 11th of February, at about 3 p.m. The release of Nelson Mandela was important for, for all sorts of reasons for News of Ten. Before that, nobody had ever been allowed to do satellite transmissions except through the South African Broadcasting Corporation. It was one of the ways in which the South African authorities controlled what any branch of the media said about the country. Good evening from Soweto, where I'm speaking to you amid unprecedented scenes. Just across the street from a house which is about to stamp its name on the consciousness of the world as the one to which Nelson Mandela will return, and at the end of a day which must radically alter the course of this country's future. With the release of Mandela, a new age dawn, we said to somebody, we are going to go out and we're going to put a satellite into Soweto, and we're going to do news at 10 live there. It is going to be a long road, but we've got to say today we are feeling fantastic, fantastic, and freedom is coming, man. This was the moment the world paused to applaud, the day the myth yielded to the man and Nelson Mandela walked to freedom. It was the army here who eventually gave the people their victory, throwing down their weapons and joining them on Wednesday. Tonight they were with them on the balcony. This is the wall the East Germans themselves built, and they don't like to see it broken down from the West. It certainly enabled people to have a, a, an eyewitness view of contemporary history that they would never have dreamt of having before. The world had become journalistically smaller in television terms. We could cover more stories from more parts of the world more quickly. Uh, and with more immediacy uh, than had ever been done. With that, however, came fresh responsibilities uh, as, as, as journalists, if you like, because there was less time to think about what we were doing and whether we were doing it correctly and whether what we were bringing before the public very rapidly uh, was the unvarnished truth or whether it was in some cases propaganda. To some extent, we became tempted to play with the toys. I mean, probably the most famous incident was Sandy Gall and his tea towel in uh, Afghanistan, where it was because the, 
News at 10 was going out at 4 in the morning in Afghanistan. It was pitch dark. So there was absolutely nothing to be seen. So the fact of being live from Afghanistan was not actually terribly live, wasn't terribly relevant, save for the fact that you were saying, we are actually live in Afghanistan, and I suppose that felt rather good. But it didn't actually illuminate the facts of what was going on, because basically one kept wondering why Sandy was sitting under a tea towel so far away when um, he could be in bed. As you can see, that's the latest Tomahawk cruise missile to fly just over our position here. Anti-aircraft gunners all around us are trying to shoot them down. So far, three have flown over our heads, all heading for their targets, and I think there's some more coming in over here. By some uh, definitions, the Gulf War was the first television war in the sense that television actually became a weapon of war rather than just a means of telling the story because both sides in the conflict, the Allies and to a lesser degree uh, Iraq, uh, used television as a propaganda weapon to strike at each other. I mean, you know, we saw for the first time extraordinary pictures of, quote, smart bombs you know, apparently hitting their, their targets uh, as intended with little loss of life. And we saw from the other side of the fence Iraqi pictures which we had to accept or not accept for what they said they were. Iraqi anti-aircraft gunners probed the sky with trails of tracer bullets, but no attacking aircraft were visible to the naked eye. The Gulf War was still to some extent under a military control about where people could go, but far more of it was seen live uh, and far more of it was instantly available. Launch! Missile away! Yes, sir. There is a real editorial issue about live coverage of an event like a major war, that um, there is a danger that it does become almost a form of entertainment. The rockets lifted up from, uh, from the base behind me and uh, were clearly addressing some kind of target, uh, but the sirens have just stopped for the time being. Uh, but we are, I think, under another attack at the moment, and therefore I'm going to pass you very swiftly back to the studio. It should astonish people that they can sit in their living room with a, a glass of wine or a cup of tea, feet up, and at 10 o'clock on a programme like News at 10, watch a live air raid on somebody else's capital city. Less than an hour after the ground war began, the sirens sounded in Riyadh to signal another missile attack. It should give us pause for thought about whether that's healthy or right that we can and, and do show that. Because of the technology, we have become targets. We've become targets in a propaganda war. People want to use us. Um, they want to point our cameras in this direction that suits them and not in that direction um, because it, it doesn't suit them. Then, of course, there's a much more brutal, less subtle way of uh, silence in the messenger, and that's um, to take him out. And there have been conflicts recently where we felt pretty much near the top of the list as far as targets are concerned. This is a civilian area on the outskirts of the city. These people were civilians trying to flee the fighting. Was it worth it? The risks that were taken, and for so little, on news at 10. It's afterwards when you're drinking with your chums, you all say to each other, what on earth was all that effort about and that incredible risk and danger uh, for, for a little telex from London saying, well done, it, one minute 15. I think the portrayal of violence is become routine now. And so people think, mm, well, if I miss that one, I'll see the next one in any case miss that train, get another one, or watch it on one of the multi, multi other channels. Boris Yeltsin's troops are firing as they advance, only just about 50 yards behind me. There's a soldier there crouched, firing his Kalashnikov towards the White House. There is so much more material, more information, more sources of picture. Cameras have become cheaper. It's cheaper to send stuff by, by satellite. It's cheaper to get to stories and to get back. Now, really, television's completely changed. Because of the technology, you can draw in pictures from all around the world and then tell somebody what story you want told. An editor will say, I've seen this here and that there. Tell me it. And that's what, what happens. You can't risk, it seems nowadays, to say to somebody, OK, I don't care what anybody else has seen. 
I just want to know what you've seen and what your camera has filmed. That was the beauty of News at 10. It was one man and his camera, one woman and her camera, going out to a story and telling it from one person's point of view. Contrast that with today where most stories will have at least four, five, six, sometimes 20 sources of pictures in it. That depersonalizes it. And News at 10 was built on the personalized report. Right, it's a strong day. Um, at the top of the list, I'm not sure. I've put Clinton <coughs> at the top at the moment. As the agenda became broader, it became more difficult for television news programs to connect with all the audience. We all became much more aware um, as there became a proliferation of programs, more channels, more news available, of the importance of people with whom the audience was familiar. So in our minds began to form the news at 10 that, that uh, we've seen throughout the, uh, throughout the 90s with Trevor MacDonald as the kind of central uh, figure, if you like, on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, as it were, pulling the strings and switching the switches and bringing up Mike Brunson from Westminster and somebody else from Washington and somebody else from the back of beyond. I think the idea behind the change of News at 10 to one single anchor was quite clear. It was about branding. It was about trying to get a close identification between the program and the person who was doing it. And finally, in the 50s, they were exciting, daring and hip. Forty years on in the 90s, teenagers seemed to find it all a bit passé. And we felt that would be good for business because we felt people would, in, a, in a, 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 what was then a growing multi-channel environment, it would give the program instant recognition. People would associate Trevor with News at 10 and News at 10 with Trevor. They would instantly know what they were watching uh, and it would be good for the ratings. The whole idea of news becoming marketed, becoming commercial, is regarded by some people as heresy. But more and more people are attracted by doing news in different ways. The chain is really news attracting the kind of audience that advertisers want to buy and the channel controllers sitting there saying, well, if I want those kind of advertisers, I need this kind of content, I need the news to deliver this kind of audience. This is, of course, complete heresy to the, to the founding fathers of television news who believed that you had a public service. And that's the way the news looks tonight. We are back tomorrow from all of us here at ITN. Good night. News programs had a great problem by the time of the late 80s, early 90s. When News at 10 started, it was one of the great shared experiences of British television. A large chunk of the population sat down every evening at 10 o'clock to watch ITV and to watch News at 10. And it was a shared experience which they could talk about the next day. And it covered areas which they all recognized as being newsworthy and important. 30 years on, it's more complicated than that. There are lots of other places to get your information. And on top of that, people have such wide interest and such a wide view of what is important. We are today a, a much more neutered, um, skeletal society when it, when it comes to our interest. We're, we're so much more self-obsessed uh, than we were in those days. There are still events which can appeal right across the board that will bring people back together from their more disparate interests. Most recently, the death of the Princess of Wales. Most of the time, they're going to want to pursue the things which are of most interest or relevance to them personally or to their families. Monroe, thank you, and then I... Cheers. News at 10. It did come of age in an extraordinary period of television news. It became part of the fabric of British life. That's not to say it should be sacrosanct, and it clearly isn't. But it did achieve that, and that is a rare achievement. And I suppose the history of News at 10 has also mirrored the history and development of television news as a medium for providing information uh, to, the mass, to the masses. Uh, and it's done its job, uh, and it is no more. A timely look behind the scenes of the Cheltenham Festival, which takes over the genteel spa town for three days this month. Cheltenham Dreams, next Sunday at 8 o'clock, here on 4.